Before we start today's vlog, I thought I'd explain really quickly why I'm deciding to go to Vegas as opposed to continuing to play poker at home. Aside from the obvious fact that I love poker and this is the place to play poker. One of the problems I've had when playing poker where I live is that it's really hard to put in volume. As I have mentioned earlier, I live in a place where there aren't too many options when it comes to poker. The closest casinos are at least a 40 minute drive away and back. And the home game that's pretty close to my house only runs three days a week. And of course, it's not open 24 seven like casinos are. I wouldn't really mind driving to a casino know if I was able to put in really long hours but I also have responsibilities at home so it kind of makes it hard to do that so this past school quarter I've been looking forward to winter break so that I could take a trip here one so that I can be in close proximity to a lot of casinos and two so I could be away from home and just focus on poker also it doesn't hurt that the poker rooms here have decent buying structures you can actually buy in for more than 20 big blinds <coughs> gardens casino one two so I'm gonna be here for three days definitely want to come back here very very soon all right so on the agenda today one we're gonna go to nacho daddy if you remember, that was the restaurant we went to with Isol and Alyssa in the very first poker vlog, and it was amazing, so I'm gonna be heading back there today. Two, I wanna try the flower drink at the Cosmopolitan. If you don't know what it is, it's basically a drink that comes with like a flower bud or something. You eat the flower, and apparently it's supposed to change your taste buds and make things taste different. And last but not least, we're gonna be playing some more poker. It's me from after the trip. Let's get into some hands. For the first hour and a half to two hours of the session, I was pretty card dead, wasn't really getting any hands. And then I pick up pocket kings in the low jack. There is a button shadow to $5, the small blind calls, the under the gun plus two player calls, and I put out a raise to $25. The button calls, the small blind folds, and the under the gun plus two player makes the call. So we are headed three ways to a flop, which comes 796 rainbow. Not the best flop for kings, but I still should be ahead most of the time. The under the gun plus two player checks it over to me. I put out a continuation bet of $55. The button makes the call and the under the gun plus two player only has about $60 behind and shoves. I make the call of course for $5 more, not going anywhere. And the button makes the call as well. So one player all in, heads up to a turn, which comes the three of hearts bringing a back for a flush draw. Otherwise though, it's pretty much a blank. It's hard to believe any of the hands my opponents could have improved here. Maybe the occasional 5-4 suited, but other than that, if I was ahead earlier, I still should be ahead. The button only has $227 behind, and the pot is around 250 I believe, something like that. Given that the button just called my c-bet instead of raising, I don't think he should have sets too often here. Don't think he should have straights either. There aren't too many of those. Four combos of 10-8 suited, and 8-5 doesn't seem very likely. Same goes for two pair hands like 7-6. I think he should be raising those hands on the flop, given that the flop is very coordinated. But then again, he could very well call, hoping that the under the gun plus two player comes along. I think the most likely hands he has here, though, are top pair type hands with a straight draw. Hands like 10-9, 9-8, occasionally hands like pocket eights or 8-7, and maybe even pocket tens or ace nine, something like that. So there's still plenty of worse hands I can get value from, and I want to make sure to charge draws the maximum here. So I put the button all in for his remaining 227. He goes into the tank, but eventually makes a fold. So not gonna get any more money from this player, but I do still have to beat the under the gun plus two player in order to win the pot. He says he needs an eight, and the river brings the 10 of diamonds. I show my hand and he shows queen 10 offsuit. So we take this one down. Not too long afterwards, I am in the big blind and I look down at pocket aces. There's a button shadow to five once again. The player on the button in this instance is a young player who is very aggressive and I believe he said he's from Mexico. I had seen him open raise to 20 plus before, so definitely a very aggressive player. The small blind, who is an older gentleman, raises it up to 10. I put out a three bet here to $35. Action folds back to the button who straddled and he puts out a small four bet to $80. The small blind folds and now action is back on me. The button started the hand with about $400 and I am covered. So I think in some instances I could flat here to trap, 
but I definitely want to put out a five bet here since we are playing very deep stacks and I want to get the money in as soon as possible. In addition to that, a four bet is pretty rare at one two. So I think I can assume he has a pretty strong hand here and I do want to get value. So the question is what sizing do I want to use? And I think a standard sizing in this situation would be something like 250. If he does flat the 250 though, he will have only about 150 left in a $500 pot. So raising to something like 250 might induce him to go all in. So I think that's definitely a good option. In this situation though, I just decided to put him all in for his remaining 400 or so. And he pretty quickly makes the call. The board runs out queen 8899. I show my pocket aces and he taps the table as if to say your hand's good. And he shows pocket kings. So we got ourselves involved in a classic cooler situation. Fortunately, I was on the winning side of it. In this specific instance, it ended up working out and I got max value. I think in hindsight though, I would have rather liked a smaller five bet. Putting him all in for his remaining 400 is a pretty large raise. And I think in certain situations, he'll be able to find a fold more often. I think if he had a hand like ace king or queens, putting him in a tough spot by raising smaller might have been the better option. In this next hand, I am in the cutoff with jack 10 of clubs. There are two limps and I raise it up to 10 and get four callers. So we are five ways to a flop, which comes 10, three, six, two hearts. Action checks to the hijack who puts out a tiny bet of $7. Normally with a mediocre top pair type hand like jack 10, I wouldn't go for a race here, I just call. But given that this player bets so small, I think he could be setting his own price to see a turn card if he does have something like a heart draw. So I'm not gonna let him get away with that. I decide to raise it up to 30. Action folds back, so the hijack who makes the call. So we are heads up to a turn, which brings another three. This time the hijack checks it over to me, and I think for a little bit, and decides to check back. And I think I made a mistake here. My rationale for checking back at the time was that the hijack only had $100 behind, and I didn't think he would call with worse, so I didn't think I was gonna get value from flush draws here. But I think looking back, since I am playing at 1-2 and a lot of players like to chase draws, I think I could go for thin value here and either put them all in or even bet something really small like half pot since a lot of players at these stakes don't really understand implied odds. I've seen players do all sorts of things at these stakes. So I think I could have gone for a small bet or put them all in this situation and try to charge him the max. Anyways, the point being, I don't think checking was a good option here. He could have been betting the flop with something like top pair, but if he did have a better top pair like ace 10, king 10, queen 10, or even jack 10. I think there's a higher chance he would have raised preflop instead of limping. So I think my hand's good in this situation. And the three on the turn, though it didn't help my range at all, it shouldn't have helped him much either. So I think I could have played more aggressively here. Anyways, the river brings the king of clubs. So the flush draw misses. The hijack checks once again. And once again, I think I could have just bet here, tried to get a weaker 10 to call. But uh, I just checked back again and he says he has nothing and shows Queen seven of hearts, so we take it down. Not really happy with how I played this hand, probably a little bit too passive. And uh, I think the king on the river might have played a role in me checking back, even though he shouldn't have too many kings in his range, especially if he checks the river. Pretty sure he would have been betting if he had some kind of flush draw that hit top pair. So I think I played it a little too cautiously. Let me know your thoughts. In this final hand, I am in the small blind with ace deuce of spades. There is a button straddle once again to $5. And given that I am essentially under the gun in this hand since there is a straddle, in addition to the fact that I'm gonna be out of position 100% of the time post flop being in the small blind, I think there's one I should just let go. But in this hand, I decided to raise it up to $15. Part of the reason for doing this was because there was a decent number of deep stacks at the table, probably two or three, not including myself. And uh, that's not something you see very often at one two. And by deep stack, I mean 100 big blinds or more. The deep stacks in this session were closer to maybe 125 to 150 big blinds or more. And the deeper the stacks get, the more valuable suited aces become since you can win more money when you hit the nut flush. So that was part of my reason for deciding to play this hand. Anyways, action folds to the cutoff, who is the same player who had kings against my aces. And he makes the call and the button makes a call as well. So we are three ways to a flop, which comes... 10 jack nine, two spades. I actually decide to check, even though normally I would be betting flush draws on the flop as the preflop raiser. And the reason for this is because I think this flop hits the cutoffs and the buttons calling ranges much more than it hits my range, raising from early position. So I just want to see what they did, possibly put in a check raise, as opposed to leading out here and getting raised myself. The cutoff decides to put out a bet here and makes it 38. The button makes the call and now action is back on me. The cutoff had maybe $200 behind after making this bet, so 
I'm definitely gonna continue here. It's a matter of deciding to just call or to raise. If I do raise here though, the stack sizes make it kind of awkward. I would have to raise to at least something like 130. Probably gonna get reshoved on if my opponents decide they wanna continue with the hand and I don't wanna have to call it off with ace high here. So I decide to just call here and see a turn. The turn brings the deuce of hearts. So we make bottom pair. I decide to check again and action checks through. So looking for a little help here, which does not come. The river brings the three of hearts, so we brick. I decide to just give up here and I check. I'm blocking flush draws. I'm not blocking king jack or queen jack or even king queen, although I think king queen would have probably bet the turn. But I just don't think I can push both opponents off of their hands if they do in fact have a made hand. The cutoff bets $100, the button folds, and I make the fold as well. So not sure if I played this hand the best. Probably should have folded pre-flop as played. Maybe a raise on the flop would have been better as played on the flop. Perhaps leading out on the river might have been a possibility that I looked past. So let me know if you have any thoughts on this hand. May I just see your ID, please? Yeah, sure. You can't record, is that right? Oh, I'm sorry. That's fine. Yeah. As you heard, I couldn't record at the cashier, but I was in for 660 total and cashed out for 770 minus the $1 trip that I kept from my collection. Ended up making $109 total. Stop by CVS real quick to get myself a quick snack. Now I'm gonna head to the Cosmopolitan to get the drink I was talking about. I waited for a long time before driving again. Since I didn't include as many hand histories as I usually do, I thought I'd quickly answer some frequently asked questions in a new segment I like to call Fun Facts. I know it's pronounced FAQs, but saying facts allows me to make a pun. First question, what app do you use to track your poker stats? I use an app called PokerMate. It's free with the option to pay for additional features. Everyone was commenting on poker vlog number five about how long my nails are. The nails on my right hand are kept long and the nails on my left hand are kept short. I started taking classical guitar lessons in November of 2012, stopped fairly recently. So in that five year period, my teacher suggested that I grow up my nails as a lot of guitarists do so that I could play more easily and the sound would be better. So just relax, my nails are fine. A few people asked about me not tipping the cashier in the Excalibur episode. I wasn't aware that tipping the cashier was something people did. Everything I know about poker room etiquette in regards to tipping, I learned from watching other poker vloggers. So I either never saw a poker vlogger tip the cashier or I never noticed. Thankfully, one of the commenters let me know that a standard tip is $2. So I will be tipping cashiers from now on and now you know to do so as well. Do I edit myself? Yes, I do. What software do I use? Sony Vegas Pro 13. Kind of a neat coincidence that the editing software I use happens to be called Vegas. The last frequently asked questions are about me recording at the poker table. I use my phone to record. I put it in between my chip stack and the perimeter of the table and it holds there just fine. I hit record and let it run until I finish playing a hand that I decide to include in a vlog. Then I stop recording, go to my library, crop that video down to just the hand that I'm going to include in the vlog and then repeat the process all over again. It does take up a lot of battery and sometimes my phone dies, which is why I bring this along with me. It's an external battery pack. That's it for the questions. Two more things. Thank you for 3,000 plus subscribers and want to give a quick shout out to Ryan from 9to5poker. He emailed me letting me know that he added my vlog to the poker vlog section of 9to5poker.com. So feel free to check that out when you get the chance. All right, back to the vlog. Made it back to Excalibur. I was planning on playing poker two times today in different places, but I started feeling a little tired and just wanted to get organized and everything. It was probably past eight by the time I got back here, so I figured I wouldn't be able to put in a decent amount of hours and go to bed early. Had to have one or the other, and I figured I'd want to be well rested for tomorrow. It's a little past midnight, I'm gonna go to bed now. Yeah, another good session here. I actually have not had a losing session in Vegas so far, so Vegas has treated me well so far. With that, I'm gonna be back at the poker tables tomorrow. I will see you next time. Clean.